Okay, class, welcome to lecture 27. Today we are talking about equivalence relations, which are just special kinds of relations, which are the thing we learned about last time. Um, and we've already set out on the path to defining this, but first we need to finish defining some other things before we can say what an equivalence relation is. Okay, um, so here is one more definition related to the last two definitions in the previous video. Um, and so what's going on is if you have a relation, you can think about additional properties that it has. And we last time we saw that a relation could be reflexive or symmetric. Um, this time a relation R is called transitive. So there's reflexive, there's symmetric, and now there's transitive relations. Um, when the following statement is true, if A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. So it's like this little chain. Um, the word transitive comes from the property that's called the transitive property of equality. Um, but just think of it as if A is related to B and B is related to C, then it makes sense, hopefully, that you should go across the chain from A to B to C. That's what this is saying. So relations don't always have to have this property, but it's especially nice when they do. Okay, um, so let's see lots of examples. And I'm going to use all the relation jargon just to remind you of how relations work and what they are. So the relation, we looked at something like this one last time, I think, R. So remember a relation is a subset of what it goes from times what it goes to. So first of all, relation goes from something, from a set. So in this case, the real numbers to real numbers again, um, given by or created by greater than, um, this guy is transitive. So remember how this all works. Um, so, so what kind of things are related to what kinds of things? So just a little mini example to remind you, so like five is related to seven. Let me not use seven because it looks like greater than five. And also that's not true. I said, I said the wrong thing. Five is related to two because, because there's a C in it, um, five is bigger than two. Um, and then another way to say that is that five comma two is in this subset R of the product of the two sets as you're going from and to, which in this case is the real numbers and the real numbers. Okay, so just a lot of fancy stuff to really just say that five is bigger than two. Um, so why is R transitive? Well, we're not gonna do a real formal proof. Hopefully you can just believe it. Um, it's because if I know that X is bigger than Y and I know that Y is bigger than Z, then that tells you X is bigger than Y is bigger than Z. So X is definitely bigger than Z. Um, and so X being related to Y and Y being related to Z implies that X is related to Z. So that's what it means for a relation to be transitive. So this is transitive. Um, here's another one equals equals is also transitive because now saying things a little bit quicker in a quicker way um, just because if a equals b and b equals c then it is true that A equals B equals C, so A equals C is true. 
Um, now I'm leaving out a lot of words here. So e equality is a relation from the real numbers to the real numbers again. And so you create a subset R by using equals to determine when two things are related. And the subset R has the property that if A comma B, you can say it just like this, is in R and B comma C is in R, then A comma C is in R. It's another way to say transitive property because this is exactly the same as saying A is related to B. And this is the same as saying B is related to C. And this is the same as saying A is related to C. Okay, so many ways to say the same thing. Um, what's another example of a transitive relation? Um, divides. So where, so how is the relation being formed? A is related to B when A divides B. So that is telling you which elements are in the subset R. Um, this time it's not from the real numbers to the real numbers because we don't talk about the word divides in the context of real numbers. We just talk about it in context of integers. So really this time it's from Z to Z. So R is a subset of Z times Z. Just to remind you of how this notation works. Okay, um, this one will actually prove, and it'll sort of give you like a proof structure if you wanna prove other relations are transitive. So let's prove that this is a transitive relation. So what this really means is we need to show an if then statement. So we gotta prove the following, if A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. But in the context of R, the relation being given by divides. So we're just gonna translate this. If A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. So this is what we really need to show to show that the relation is transitive. So we don't really think about how this is really coming from some fancy concept called a transitive relation. Once we get started on the proof and we realize this is all I'm trying to prove. This is not so fancy. We learned this kind of stuff a long time ago, actually. Um, and so this proof I could have asked you to do a long time ago without saying all this fancy stuff. So the key to showing that a, tr a relation is transitive is really being able to, first of all, extract a statement like this. And then now it's at a lower level proof, do this. Okay, so we know how to prove things like this. So it's an if then statement. That means I have to let the if part be true. And then I have to show the conclusion follows. And it's an if-then proof, so all I'm going to do is, is expand upon what these things mean. So what does it mean if A divides B? This means, got to remember stuff from a while ago, that B equals A times N for some integer N. Um, since um, B divides C, this means C equals bm for some integer m. Now we got to combine these facts to show that a divides c somehow, which means I got to talk about c equaling a times something, hopefully. Well, right now, all I know is c equals b times m. But luckily, m is just a times n. So then if I just rearrange the parentheses, this shows that a divides c because C equals A times some integer. Okay, so this is how a proof that a relational is transitive will typically go. 
something like this. Um, so we are going to do another one for extra practice right now. OK. So, so this relation is transitive, divides. And now let's talk about the new relation we learned about last time called mod congruency mod n is also a transitive relation. So remember what this means. A is congruent to B mod n when n divides A minus B. And so when this happens, this is when A is related to B. This is the relation that you create by using congruency mod n. Okay, so to show it's a transitive relation, we're gonna follow basically the same steps. The hard part is sort of setting it up. So what I'll do still is I'll still just write the definition of a transitive relations. So we must prove what we wanna show an if then statement. If A is related to B and B is related to C, then a is related to C. And then I'm just gonna translate this into the relation I'm actually dealing with, congruency mod N. So this becomes if A is congruent to B mod N and B is congruent to C mod N, then A is congruent to C mod N. That's what I'm trying to show so that this chain holds. A is congruent to B, B is congruent to C. Hopefully A is also congruent to C because it uses B as like a middle ground to get to C. Okay, um, so the key to actually proving it as usual is always to just say what things really mean. So this is gonna come in handy a lot because this is what it really means for A to be congruent to B mod N. But then we know all about divides. This really means that a minus b equals n times x. So that's what we're gonna be saying a lot over here. Okay, so let's do that. Since a is congruent to b mod n, what does this actually mean? This means that n divides a minus b, which doesn't tell us enough yet. So let's say what that really means, I'll just say it underneath really means that um, a minus b equals nx for some integer x. And I'm just gonna do that for, for b being congruent to c mod n because that's also in the assumption. Um, so I guess I didn't write let, but sorry. So in between these two steps should really be let this happen and let this happen. show that this will happen. Okay, so since the first thing happens, this is what we get. Since um, B is congruent to C mod N, we get to say something there too. This means N divides um, B minus C, which really means something more useful that B minus C equals N Y for some integer Y. Um, and this is where scratch work comes in handy because the idea is now is I want to somehow put this, this and this together to tell me that A is congruent to C mod N. So secretly on the side, I say, what does that really mean? Because this is what I need to do. Well, I need to get N equals A minus, or sorry, oops, got it all backwards. I really need to get that um, a minus c equals n times something. And I don't know what that something will look like yet. So I really need to look at a minus c. So how can I combine these two equations so that a minus c appears? Well, actually it's already set up quite nicely. If I just add the two equations together, what, what do I get? 
I get A minus B. So if I add both left sides together, I get that. And if I add both right sides together, I get that. Aha, we're just about done. So A minus C does equal N times some integer. So um, N does divide A minus C. So A is congruent to C mod N is the conclusion. Thus, uh, the relation is transitive. Okay, so that's good. Um, but next, we're going to put this together with what we did last time. So recall that we showed congruency mod n is um, also a symmetric and a reflexive relation. So it's also, I guess I'll write reflexive first and symmetric. So just to remind you what those meant, reflexive meant that everything is related to itself, which in this case means that A is congruent to A mod N for any A in the integers. And symmetric meant another if then statement, if A is related to B, then B is related to A. Um, and so this is really saying that if A is congruent to B mod N, then B is also congruent to A mod N. Okay. Um, so I think I make you prove that in the lecture problems, actually. I don't know if I did it in the video. Okay. But in any case, um, we have that it's reflexive, that it's symmetric, and that now it's transitive. So this leads us to a new definition. A relation which is which has all the powers that you possibly want. So it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. It's a super ultra ultimate special relation. So it gets its own name. It's called an equivalence relation. So the name is a very good name because what's really going on is when you have a relation like this, what it does is it forces some elements to sort of be the same as other elements for all intents and purposes. So like we actually did see that last time and we'll go through it again. The idea is that all the numbers that are the same mod n are not equal, so we don't call them equal, but they do all the same things, and so we're going they're called equivalents, uh, equivalent. And so the idea is that this relation creates an equivalence between your elements in the sets. Uh, so that's the fancy stuff, um, and we'll do an example to, to nail it down. But first, let's just summarize the ones we've already seen. So this guy, mod n, uh, congruency mod n is an equivalence relation. Um, so is equal equality of numbers, um, but there's lots of that are not. So greater than, less than, and divides are not. So for example, these two were not reflexive. That's funny, I sort of made a little face here. Ooh. So these two are not reflexive because five is not bigger than five and five is not less than five. Um, this one was also not reflexive because, oh, sorry, it is reflexive. That's fine because everything divides itself, but it's not symmetric. And we saw that it is transitive. Um, it's not symmetric because, for example, 5 divides 10, but 10 does not divide 5. 
Um, so mod n is congruency mod n is super special because it gets all has all three properties being obeyed. Equals is just like so good that of course it obeys everything, but it's boring because equals just means that two things are exactly the same. Congruency mod n means like they act the same even though they're not the same number, which is more interesting to think about. And equality, because equality is just boring. Like, oh, they're exactly the same? Five equals five? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so why is an equivalence relation important? I hinted at this last time without ever saying what an equivalence relation was, but now we'll say it. So an equivalence relation R, so remember relation goes from a set to a set, but whenever we're talking about these extra special relations, they're always going from the set to itself. Um, so what it, an equivalence relation always does is it breaks the set up, the set A up into subsets, which are called equivalence classes. These are not classes you take. These are classes of things. Um, and what are these guys? They are subsets of A that break up A into, into different pieces where each piece just has all the elements that are related to each other. So we'll go through an example. Um, very good example that we already saw last time, sort of. But 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 here's the point: A gets chopped up into bits, and say it gets chopped up into like five subsets or something. None of the subsets will overlap, so they'll all contain different elements of A, and each subset will consist of all the elements that are related to each other. Okay, so let's see an example using mod n, um, but we'll be even more precise. Let's use mod four. So congruency mod four from z to z supposedly should break z into um, subsets. In fact, it's going to be four subsets and here they are and here the idea is that all the guys that are related to each other are in one set so last time we actually did this we said like zero is congruent to four all the multiples of four are congruent to each other and then one is congruent to five it's congruent to nine and so on like that And then two get the same business, three get the same business. Um, so this is where the word equivalence comes from because the idea is no, four does not equal zero, but under this relation, four and zero are equivalent to each other. Um, and because an equivalence relation breaks things up where there's no overlap. So notice that each one of these has different elements. They never, they'll never overlap. Also, they go to the negatives. I forgot to write that, but in any case, they never overlap. So, so the idea will be that like every guy in the first set is equivalent to each other. And I don't have to worry about if there's something sneaking in there that's not supposed to be in there. Okay. Um, but anyway, what are the subsets? Okay, so here are the, the four subsets are just, I think I wrote this last time, in fact. The four subsets are just the subsets consisting of elements that are the same, that are equivalent under this relation. So I don't want to do subtraction, so you, you figure out the negative one there if you want. 
So then we get these four sets. Um, so these together make up all of Z, but they're all disjoint from each other, meaning they have no intersection. In other words, each of their intersections between each other is just the empty set. Um, so then more extra jargon is just this. We say elements of the same equivalence class are called equivalent. So this is not so important to remember. So we would say four is equivalent to zero, is equivalent to negative four, five is equivalent to one, two is equivalent to six, and whatever else is in there, and so on like that. Um, but that's just a little bit of extra jargon. Um, so then what people do is they pick representatives of each equivalence class, and they write things like this. So what we're going to do is, is this next. Um, so then for each equivalence class, we don't always want to write a giant set every time. So we denote a bar to mean the equivalence class with a in it. So up here, I could call this guy zero bar, but I could also call it four bar, or I could call it negative four bar or so on like that. Whichever one you want to pick as your favorite element in the set. This would be like one bar, this could be six bar, two bar, three bar, whatever you want to pick. Um, so that's just extra jargon, um, which will come in handy later. Will it come in handy right now? Let's see. Yes, I will. It will because now, so then what people do, now we get even crazier. So then people study the set of equivalence classes. So they take the equivalence classes that they just created by doing this process, which really comes from using a relation to break up the set into pieces, to subsets called equivalence classes. So now what they do is they consider a set consisting of whose elements are the um, equivalence classes. So in this situation, they would write something like this. So here, they would, they would look at this set. And then they would stop there because four bar, that's just the same as zero bar. So that's actually the same exact subset, the same equivalence class. Therefore it's the same element of this set. So I don't need to, so I don't need to write it. So if I, want to consider the set of all the equivalence classes, it's just going to have these four elements in there. And then what people do is they treat these guys as their own very fancy numbers. And they try to add them. So for example, they say, they might say like, what's three bar plus two bar. Um, so then very smart answer would be, well, f how about five bar? But then five bar, that's just the equivalence class that has five in it, but that's the equivalence class that has one in it. So then we get this interesting type of arithmetic where three plus two is one and the arithmetic sort of wraps around. 
So you would get like three plus three would be six, but that's the same as two. So in this world, three plus three is two. Um, and then they call this set, they define the set to be Z because it all came from the integers and because you used mod four, subscript four. So this is just hinting at a bunch of future stuff and maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here by talking about it. But I just wanna show you what equivalence classes do for you. So they take your original set Z. So let's just go through it one more time. So here is an equivalence relation. So it'll automatically chop the set that it's going from and to, in this case is Z, into some amount of subsets. It doesn't have to be four. In this case, it is four. But however many you get, each one of those subsets are called equivalence classes. Um, and then you create a set consisting of the equivalence classes. And then you try to define some sort of arithmetic on that set, on the elements of that set. And you end up doing stuff like this. Um, so just very quickly to see the process a bit faster. So for example, if I do mod seven, this will create um, seven equivalence classes. If you follow all the same rules. And then Z seven would be the set of these equivalence classes. I don't know why I wrote them vertically over there. I should just write them right here. And then you might try to do arithmetic on these elements. So you might say like, what is four bar plus four bar? Well, that's eight bar. So then you go and you look and you say, where does eight which equivalence class is eight in? Eight is congruent to which one of these mod seven? Um, well, I could do that one in my head. It's one, because eight minus seven. Eight minus one is seven. So eight minus one is congruent, is uh, divisible by seven. So eight is congruent to one. So that's why this would be one. So you would say like four plus four is one. But all this is really just clock arithmetic. This is just clock arithmetic on a clock with, in this case, eight numbers, but it would be whatever n is. And the previous one would be four. Um, so you can create clock arithmetic with any number of numbers, not just 12 in this way. Okay, I think I got a little ahead of myself. It was too much fun. Um, so next, let's just say some facts about equivalence classes in general. Um, so here's a theorem. So not just for mod, but for any equivalence classes, this is how everything will work. Let A be a... Um, non-empty set, so it's got to have at least one thing in it just so it, to not be too annoying. And R be an equivalence relation from A to A. Then these facts are true. Um, for every A and A, A should be in the equivalence class of A. So this is just because R is reflexive by definition of being an equivalence relation. It's already, so it's not a formal proof, but it's already reflexive. So A is related to A. 
and a bar is the equivalence class. It's all the things which are equivalent to A. And since A is equivalent to A, it's in here. So that's the mini proof. You can write up a nice one if you want. Um, two for any two elements in A, if A is related to B, then they give you the same equivalence class. So again, to ground ourselves, we could think about the big examples we just did. Looking way up here to see if it makes sense. So, so for example, four is congruent to negative four. And yes, they give you the same equivalence class. So why does this work more generally? Um, let's see, do I wanna to try to prove it off the top of my head? No, I'll just put it in the lecture problems instead. Don't wanna fail on camera, embarrassing. Don't wanna be a TikTok or something. Um, so the last property is that either the two equivalence classes are the same or they're completely different. Meaning they have no intersection at all. Um, they have nothing in common. And that's exactly what we saw in that earlier example happening. Oops, passed, or no, yeah, there it is. So yeah, so either the equivalence class is exactly the same, like one bar and five bar and all the guys in there would be exactly the same because the entire set's the same, or the entire set is disjoint. So this guy has nothing in common with this guy, for example. Okay, um, and to finish this, I want to do one very fancy example of an equivalence relation. I'm just gonna share it with you. So it's an equivalence relation on the rational numbers. So it goes from, from Q to Q. Um, and it's gonna be defined in this very weird way. So rational numbers, they look like A over B, right? Where A and B are integers and B is not zero. So we're gonna say that two fractions, two rational numbers, are related when I subtract them and their difference is an integer. So it's very weird. It's very hard to, to picture but let's try to think of some examples. So for example, three fourths is related to seven fourths because if I do three fourths minus seven fourths, I get negative four fourths, which is negative one, which is an integer. So those two are related. Um, but in general, it's very hard to like picture all the things that are related and it's not gonna break up Q into like five pieces or something like that, something nice. There's gonna be infinitely many equivalence classes. Um, but I think in the lecture problems, I'll try to get you to prove some stuff about it. Okay, cause I'm tired. So that'll be the end of this lecture. See you next time.